Right, it's just coming up to eight o'clock, so uh, welcome to everyone who's uh, popped in so far. The numbers are still going up. Um, I hope you've got um, paper and pen at the ready to make some notes. Um, it's about special relativity this week. Don't feel that you've got to understand all the physics, so you can't do anything because you haven't sort of had a, a lecture course in special relativity. Um, what you're doing is uh, is using the ideas as they are um, to develop uh, some model, to investigate some aspect of special relativity. Um, you don't have to always start at the very beginning, uh, getting the first principles and working from there. Um, life just isn't like that sometimes, uh, though it how is how you are often taught topics at school. So just launch in, pick up some ideas, things you can do, try some small exercises and write down um, the ideas as you come across them. But don't sort of worry about, oh, I don't quite understand every equation. Um, that may come later, but you can still use them because they are true. So you can do some modeling and uh, follow this up. So uh, thank you very much. Here we go. Right. Good evening, everybody. So we're going to do something a bit different today. Uh, we're going to talk about special relativity. Uh, so about time dilation, length contraction, loss of simultaneity, and maybe even equals mc squared. So um, and also, given this is part of the computational physics challenge, um, as we go along, I'll be making some probably unsubtle hints of the sort of <laughs> technical projects you might want to engage with. So uh, definitely, this is going to be perhaps more of a story than perhaps some of the other uh, little sort of seminars we've got. Um, so um, some of this may be familiar to you, some of this may be completely new. Um, so I will point out some waypoints. So definitely download the presentation, if not now, um, uh, later on. Uh, go through it several times in slow time and choose a part of it and see if you can make the graphs or make a little simulation. I think that's a really good way of getting to access, you know, getting to grips with the material. Um, and I think that's pretty much true of, of this entire course, actually. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, and if this is the first time you've come to the BFO Computational Challenge, uh, welcome to Special Relativity. So I'm just going to bring this up. And uh, can I just confirm that my splash screen is visible? Yes. Excellent. Right. So uh, this is based on a, a number of courses. Um, so my fantastically enthusiastic college, uh, colleague, Jeremy Douglas from Winchester College, this is kind of based on a, on a sort of classic talk, which he's given many years. And he's invented this concept of uh, no hamsters and no ducks. Uh, we'll talk about this later. So um, these slides sort of grew out of my way of um, putting some sort of pictures to his sort of <laughs> quite verbal presentation. Uh, there are also some notes of my colleague, uh, Dr. Barron as well. And there's an amazing book by Schwartz and McGuinness called Introducing Einstein. So if you've never done any of this stuff before, um, I'd recommend getting this book. It's, it's really short. It's a kind of cartoon based book from the company Icon Books. Uh, there'll be a link at the end. Um, they just have the most amazing series of things. Um, I think in some ways slightly better, dare I say it, than a, than a big old sort of uh, verb, verb, you know, word-based tome. Um, so anyway, um, we'll, we'll talk about links at the end. But there we are. Uh, so uh, life is not light is not like a duck in German, and light is not like a hamster. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. So um, there's going to be some people in this story. In fact, all the physics uh, was. Well, it probably existed, obviously, in the universe, but was it discovered by humans? And so, uh, you know, it's not a dry subject. It's a human subject. In my classroom, I have all the people of physics uh, around the walls. So see some of the main characters. Uh, Galileo, so thinking mechanics, motion, the scientific method itself. Uh, Christian Huygens, theory of waves. Isaac Newton, mechanics, calculus, optics, well, pretty much everything. Alchemy, but wasn't very nice to Robert Hooke, so we don't really like Newton, but he was the grand man of this whole sort of subject, really. Thomas Young, we're talking about diffraction. Now, why have I mentioned all these people? Because we're going to bring in some of these ideas together to form special relativity. OK, um, a few other people. Uh, we've got Fresnel, OK, um, Humphrey Davy, Michael Faraday, Hermann von Helmholtz for electromagnetism and uh, Foucault and Physio for measuring the speed of light with clockwork. All right, so these are sort of coming into the more the kind of 19th century. And then we've got James uh, Clark Maxwell, okay, um, Edward Morley, Mickelson, Marconi, Hertz, Lawrence, right? So we've got electromagnetism here. You think, hang on, this is all about mechanics and time and space, but actually 
that this is also to do with electromagnetism because this is all to do with the speed of light being a constant, which is a fundamentally strange idea, but it is true. And we have to modify our mechanics to take into account that fundamental truth. So here we go. Albert Einstein, as a young man, 1905, that's his Annus Mirabilis, three classic papers, uh, later wins the Nobel Prize for one of them. And one of them really is the sort of root of special relativity. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're also going to use a kind of interpretation method by Richard Feynman. Uh, so uh, who's a fantastic physicist, you know, won the Nobel Prize himself for path integrals and quantum electrodynamics. But he's also really properly famous as an amazing teacher. Um, he also picked locked paints and played the bongos as well. I think he's got a bit part in, in the Oppenheimer film or rather the actor that plays uh, Richard Feynman. He's the guy playing the bongos in the background. So and interestingly, a certain Max Planck was the editor <laughs> of uh, an element of physics where Einstein published his uh, his, his sort of uh, uh, key paper on the electromagnetic uh, of uh, moving bodies. OK, so there we are. Hello. Oh, um, OK, so we're going to start off with light. All right. So perhaps I think the best understood of all physical phenomena. Uh, this is a hyperspectral image from NASA. So what do I mean by that? We use it. We're combining infrared, possibly gamma rays, X-rays, visible um, this is the kind of thing we, you know, uh, you, you're looking at galaxies here. Um, the James Webb Telescope produces even incredible imagery. So basically, we can only really scratch and sniff things which are pretty close. We've got the Voyager probes, which have gone beyond our, our solar system, but not that far. Only a few, uh, maybe a hundred, few hundreds of astronomical units. That's the Earth-Sun distance. To get to um, you know, a million light years, a billion light years. <laughs> impossible to, uh, you know we, we can we just would never happen however we can interpret the light that comes from those distant objects and say something about what those things are made of and this is amazing so basically the vast majority of the information we get from the rest of the universe is via light so interesting enough this is the solar spectrum so this is the spectrum of light so if you look at the light through a spectroscope and you work out the kind of intensity sort of power per unit area at different wavelengths um, outside the uh, solar system, you get this sort of sort of hump curve like this. All right. And that's uh, where the dips are. You can infer the absorption of by different molecules like oxygen and ozone, and water and that kind of thing. Uh, the spectral lines. This is all you know, to do with quantum mechanics. So we can actually infer the actual um, sort of uh, elements that are producing this light. You know what the stars are made of, mostly hydrogen and helium. So um, here we are. Here's the electromagnetic spectrum, which I'm sure you've, you know now. Um, so, and uh, there's another little graph of looking at our sun through different uh, sort of spectral wavelengths. You see different structures if you look at it in the UV or in the infrared. The visible is kind of boring, really. You see the sunspots and much else. Um, so, um, and here's an amazing picture of sort of looking towards the center of the galaxy. Um, and what we're doing is a superimposing a visible image, something from Hubble perhaps, um, with X ray and gamma ray imagery. And you see this incredible sort of um, uh, sort of uh, a dipole pattern. But <laughs> look at the scale, 50,000 light years is the scale of on this. So light is really important and that's gonna be at the heart of our story. So, okay, so light's a wave, right? It reflects, it refracts, it diffracts. You know, Huygens, Young, Fresnel, Foucault, Physio, uh, these guys um, uh, did an amazing experiment to measure the speed of light, which this is the modern unit about three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And what they did is that they, um, they shone some light. I think it was along um, the Champs-Élysées in front in Paris and uh, bounced off a, off a mirror. And they had this sort of uh, uh, clockwork design. I think it's Breguet, who's the sort of um, the, the sort of clockwork maker extraordinaire of the time. And this spanned very fast. And what you could do is it sort of formed like a sort of pattern of um, you know, blocking and then non unblocking the light. And so you're actually, although it was a tiny amount of time, you could spin this enough to work out the there and back time, a kind of strobe effect, really. So they were able to amazingly, with clockwork, work out uh, this to, I don't know, I don't know what sort of percentage error is, but uh, roughly this kind of size. Um, and we've got young slits, for those who are studying sort of A-level uh, physics. If you've got two slits there, we get this sort of uh, pattern of interference. Now, um, we look at electromagnetism. So now we're going from, you know, what the nature of light is, electrical and magnetic fields at right angles and they are transverse waves. Okay, that's pretty important too. 
Um, you can have dipoles and fields. That's a magnetic dipole. You can see the fields produced by a solenoid. So electricity and magnetism are linked, right? There's Orsted's theorem. You now the right hand, the thumbs up idea. The thumb is where the current is and the magnetic fields form a kind of vortex around these things. Um, so since, you know, the, the late 19th century, uh, we create magnetic fields from moving charges, currents, and we have charges produce electrical fields. And when charges sort of up and down our little antenna oscillate and accelerate, they produce electromagnetic waves, which are comprised themselves of electric and magnetic fields, which cause charges or currents to move. So now here's an interesting idea. So um, if you combine those things, and there's a bit of math to do, uh, the equations of James Clark Maxwell, um, if you combine all these equations together, it turns out that electromagnetic waves all travel at the same speed in a vacuum, that is. And the speed is given by one over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught. Now, what are these numbers? Well, these numbers crop up in the magnetic field um, around. So if you go back to our little Orsted's theorem, if you want to, want to work out the field strength around your wire, it's proportional to the current, interestingly, inversely proportional to the distance away from it, r. And the thing in front of it, which turns it into a Tesla, is mu naught, the permeability of free space. It's constant. Um, equivalently, if you want to look at the force between two charges, like electrons, all right, of space distance d, that's an inverse square law, like gravity. And what turns charge and distance into force is this constant epsilon naught. Now, for various technical reasons, it's downstairs rather than upstairs, um, but it's a constant with 4 pi as well. So if you, these are constants uh, that involve electrical fields and magnetic fields, but when you combine them together, and you can do this in a calculator, you get the speed of light, interestingly. That's quite cool. But what's really interesting is that speed is independent. There is nothing to do with it in the equation about how fast your source is. So if you had a source of electromagnetic waves, like a torch, you could be moving at 90% of the speed of light and the speed of waves are still at 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second in a vacuum. So that's fundamentally weirder than anything we do in mechanics. If I throw a ball at you, right, uh, at 10 meters per second, and then I run towards you at five meters per second and throw the ball, hopefully <laughs> it's not too difficult to understand that's gonna be coming at you at 15 meters per second. That's not true if I shine light at you. Regardless of how fast I move, the light you receive is always at three times 10 to the eight. That comes straight out of Maxwell's equations. So that's a weird idea, okay? So the wave speed is independent of the relative speed of EM wave source and receiver. So this is kind of why this is the sort of electromagnetic beginnings. Einstein came about his ideas by looking at Maxwell's theorems really deeply and coming up with this kind of strange conclusion. So what do we do about this? Well, let's look at waves. OK, what do we know about waves? All right. So here we go. Here's a duck on the surface of a river. A nice Kelvin wedge here. All right, which is a, that's a story for another day, but that's, a, that's another beautiful piece of physics. So sound waves, surface waves, all the vibration of a medium. So air, or water molecules. And for, uh, if you can put in the chat who this person is, it might be that if there are any teachers on this call, uh, uh, perhaps uh, Nina, you can tell me. Uh, that's an extra bonus point who that is. Uh, it's a sort of a link from about 15 years ago. Um, so uh, for EM waves, who have we got, Nina? Does anyone want to answer this? Who's this person? Not yet. <laughs> OK, this is Mystic Meg. I think she was in the National Lottery uh, when it started. So this is about showing my age. Um, so if we've got an electromagnetic wave going from the Earth to the sun, what medium is vibrating? Well, of course, let's just make something up. So it was uh, known as the luminiferous ether. Of course, this is completely wrong. All right. So there is nothing that is vibrating. Light it itself moves. How do we know this stuff? Well, um, this is uh, Morley and Mickelson, and uh, this is an experiment you should all uh, be familiar with. So light source, uh, okay, and the idea is you, it was this experiment was done on a huge table. I'm just gonna show, show what it looked like. It was a massive block of concrete on a mercury trough. This is super dangerous stuff, right? A trough of mercury with a sort of optical bench at the top in the sort of bowels of the uh, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, you know, the Case Western University. And so basically what they did is they did this sort of interferometer experiment. So light bounces off a mirror. Some goes through it, bounces off another mirror. Another light bounces off a mirror here. 
Now, if you're moving relative to the luminiferous ether, what you should find is that like a little sort of phase difference between these branches. Now, it's going to be a tiny amount of time. If you think about the sort of um, uh, you know time between waves of uh, of light, then actually you know you could be you know. 90, 170, you know, a, ser a serious amount of phase, you know, there was a fraction of a wavelength. So you would detect any differences resulting from a relative uh, speed um, as we're going through the ether. And the Earth's orbital speed is about 30 kilometers a second. So we ought to see this phase difference between the longitudinal and the transverse beams, but they observed absolutely nothing. So what's the conclusion? Well, you know, if we apply Occam's razor, you know, the sort of simplest physics idea is the one we want to go for. Um, well, maybe there isn't anything. There is no luminiferous ether. The light, it itself moves. OK, so did Michelson and Morley observe any phase difference due to the relative motion between the Earth and the ether? No. <laughs> so light is not like a duck, as Mr. Douglas would say. OK, there is no ether. Light can propagate in a vacuum. It itself moves. OK, right. That's interesting. So back to Maxwell. OK, so um, these are fundamental constants. The wave speed is independent of the relative speed of EM wave source and receiver. So let's go and assume Maxwell is correct. All right. So C is always the same in a vacuum. So there we are. We're going to do what we call a Gedanken, a thought experiment. So in other words, an experiment that, you know, is an experiment. It's not something it's something you could potentially do, but maybe we just don't have the equipment or it's too hard or too expensive, right? Involves the galaxy or something, you know, going ridiculously fast. So in other words, what would happen to my image in a shaving mirror? Here's a shaving mirror. Um, if you were to travel at the speed of light, so would your image disappear? Could I go faster than the speed of light? Um, and if so, what, what would happen? Like you'd probably smash into the, into the glass. But yeah, this is a Gedanken experiment, right? We can be on any size we like. So, all right. So what we're going to do is we're going to use what uh, what we know really well. OK, so we're going to use the mechanics of Galileo and Newton. So this is all what we've been studying in school. And what we'll do, keep things simple. We'll think of a sort of short pulse of light. So uh, light's not like a duck. It doesn't there's no medium, but maybe light is like a hamster. It's like a particle that we can throw around and we can bounce off things. So um, and this is a kind of uh, a sort of simplified argument that I, I think is related to we can we can sort of credit Richard Feynman with this sort of idea of a light clock. And, I, and I've simplified this further. So this is like in Willy Wonka uh, glass elevator. All right. So we've got this glass elevator in a box. OK. And uh, let's say it's in space in zero gravity. So there's no other the forces. So what we're doing is we're hurling this little hamster. All right. Who likes bouncing off things? That's no, you know, the hamster doesn't mind. Uh, and we hurl the hamster with velocity U. So it's an elastic hamster. It's perfectly elastic. That's fine. So the hamster bounces off the top of the roof and then goes down at U and keeps going. So in other words, the hamster is like a clock. All right. Um, so depending on the length of this. So the time it takes to go distance L uh, is L over U. All right. So there we go. So we've got our kind of hamster clock bouncing to and forth. Right. OK, so that's uh, that's that's my glass elevator from the elevator frame of reference. Now, OK, so now uh, Mr. Wonka right, is observing this elevator. Now, remember, so this is the spaceman in the elevator itself. Now, Mr. Wonka, obviously you can see through it, it's a glass elevator and the elevator is moving past Mr. Wonka at speed V. All right. There we are. There's the Charlie in the great glass elevator. So what does Mr. Wonka see? Well, um, oh, sorry, Mr. Walker supplies the glass elevator. He's, he's too busy to do the experiment. So Professor Feynman has been hired to, uh, to do this experiment for him. So Mr. Feynman's looking at this elevator move horizontally past his eyes. All right. Um, he's sort of in there. So it's not moving up and down. It's moving sideways at speed V. So what does he see? Well, as the hamster drops, all right, the frame is also moving. So from a Professor Feynman's perspective, remember, you can see through the glass and there's special no refraction glass. All right. OK, <laughs> um, so the hamster will move this diagonal path okay, from from here to there. All right. So it's still going to take uh, L over U seconds to get from there to there. All right. Delta T. Um, and in that time, uh, V delta T is the distance that the hamster moves horizontally. So that's all right with everybody. So what's the total distance traveled by the hamster? What we can do is a bit of Pythagoras. So L's that side of the triangle. 
and V delta T is the um, bottom side of the triangle, the horizontal side. So we square the both of them, square root, and just to tidy it up a little bit, I'm gonna substitute for delta T, which is L over U. So L squared over U squared, and I'm gonna factor out the L. So what have I got? I've got my distance is L times this factor here, one plus V squared over U squared. Now that's definitely gonna be bigger than one. All right, there's nothing negative here, nothing subtracted. This must be, whatever the speed, bigger than one. So what's my hamster speed observed by Professor Feynman? Well, it's gonna be distance divided by delta t. That's the time it takes. So what we can do, um, so remember one over delta t is u over l. And if we put that into this little equation, all right, so I can substitute for this one. And what I've got is u times this little factor here. So the hamster speed is bigger than the hamster speed in the elevator by this factor. All right. OK. Anyone got any questions on this before I carry on? No. Right. Fantastic. Good so far. Right. Now we're going to replace the hamster. Sorry, hamster with our light pulse. Everything else is the same. All right. So we've got a light pulse here. So the light pulse is now traveling at C because that's what we were told, right? That the light in a vacuum, and this is a, this is a vacuum. This is, there's no air inside this. The hamster, by the way, is a special space hamster, has its own breathing apparatus. It's, uh, it's fine uh, for you know, working in a vacuum. All right, no hamsters were harmed in this uh, Gedanken experiment. So uh, the light pulse is gonna travel at speed C. So this is Professor Ham Feynman's hamster speed, U one plus V squared over U squared square rooted. So it's going to be the same thing, right, for the light pulse, because basically everything else is the same, except our pulse is going a bit faster than our hamster. But this can't be correct, because according to Maxwell, right, one over square root mu naught epsilon naught, that's what the speed of light is. And it is, doesn't matter what frame of reference we observe it, right, we always observe the speed of light to be this. So this can't be correct. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we're going to have time for a bold leap of the imagination. So, well, we can eat Maxwell's either wrong or Galileo's wrong. <laughs> so let's assume that the latter is true. So light is not like a hamster. It's not like a duck. It's something completely different. So here we go. Let's talk through this really slowly. So what we're going to do is we're going to let time progress at a different rate, depending on the relative motion of the two frames of reference. So, uh, you know, it sounds like a really natural thing, isn't it? That time is absolute. It ticks at the same rate, regardless of how fast you're moving. It just sounds like that sh it's what it should be. But what if it wasn't? So let's, let's just see what happens if our time is different from Professor Feynman's frame compared to the frame that's moving. So here's a little convention that um, if you do any study of special relativity, you'll see this. So the dashed frame means the elevator frame of reference, the thing, the frame that's moving relative to you. Of course, <laughs> relative to the elevator, you're moving. So, you know, you've got to be a little bit careful here, but let's just, let's just go with this. So T dash, that's, that's the time that we release our light pulse in this frame. Okay, it's traveling at speed C. So in the elevator frame of reference, L over C is the time it takes to get from the top to the bottom. All right. So what about in Professor Feynman's frame? Well, in Professor Feynman, uh, the time delta T is from the light pulse to start. Let's just say they synchronize their watches. And when the light pulse hits the bottom, that's delta T, no dash. So we do the same as we did before. So the speed uh, of this light pulse in Professor Feynman's frame is the distance it travels along here. So L squared plus V squared delta T squared square rooted over delta T. OK, and uh, we're going to assume Maxwell's correct. So W is indeed the speed of light. All right. So according to Professor Feynman, the light pulse moves along this diagonal at the speed of light. So if you just rearrange that, so C squared delta T squared, so W is, is C, is equal to whatever we've got under the square root. OK, hopefully you can see that. So okay, I'm circling this. Can, there, can everyone see my circling? Yep. Fantastic. Right. So little tiny bit of algebra here. 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out the c delta c squared delta t squared on on this side. So I'm going to put the put that all on the other side uh, and l squared here. Then I'm going to square root. So I've got a c delta t, and inside the square root I've got a one minus v squared over c squared. So divide everything by c squared uh, once I've factored it out, and we've got this one. Okay. So you might just have to think about that um, just carefully. But you can sort of take away this bit from this bit square root and take out the c delta t. Well, c squared delta c squared and then square root that. So what we're going to now let is that l, that distance, okay? Now we can relate that in terms of Professor Feynman's frame. All right, so the distance that light pulse travels here, according to Professor Feynman, is the speed of light times delta t dash, all right? Uh, sorry, what am I talking about? Sorry, my apologies. That's uh, that's what we've got here. That's the elevator frame. So we're, substitu so we're substituting uh, l, for the speed and the time difference in the elevator frame, all right? Because we've asserted that from this. So we substitute for L and our C's now cancel. So what we've got is delta T dash, the time in the elevator, is the time in Professor Feynman's frame times this factor here. So we can simplify this by defining not this factor, but one over it. And we call this the Lorentz factor. So one minus V squared over C squared to the power of minus a half or one divided by the thing I'm circling, the square root. So in that set case, the time in the elevator frame is the time in Professor Feynman's frame divided by this factor gamma. Now, this factor gamma is going to be one or bigger. And this is where you want to go and do your first plot. All right. So the first thing now, if you is to read through all of this and now make a calculator, don't do this now, but uh, this is what I, the project one is to actually plot a graph of gamma versus v over c and then see what your time differences are uh, let's just have a look at what that might uh, might might be so if we plot this gamma factor we get something very close to one until we're a good fraction of the speed of light so this explains why this time dilation effect we just don't experience this in our world right because most of the time we're moving at speeds much much less than the speed of light but if we accelerate an electron to maybe you know, 100,000 volts, something like that, uh, and a bit, bit more than you'll get in a lab. You know, we, we tend to use in our school laboratory is about 5,000 volts. If you go about an order of magnitude higher, then actually the electron is going to be moving a good fraction of the speed of light. So we'd have to take into account this kind of these kind of ideas. So um, basically, this is this is an effect that becomes more and more serious the closer you get to the speed of light. And look at it as V gets close to C, the time dilation effect tends to infinity. So in fact, this is a really fascinating idea. At the speed of light, it's atemporal, all right? So in the moving frame, no time elapses. So for light itself, light has, there's no time, all right? So that's a really deep idea, I think. So for light, uh, light, things that are moving at the speed of light, no time elapses, okay? And also it might imply that there's just no way we can actually get to the speed of light, if that's the case. And we'll talk about the amount of work done. Um, well, maybe they're not in this session, but we'll see, we'll see how we get on. Um, OK, so there we are. So um, just to sort of show you a little program that you could write. Um, so here's one, uh, Special Rail Gamma. <laughs> so this is in MATLAB. And what we've got here, um, so I've defined a, a vector of V over C, 5,000 of them. I've defined my Lorentz factor. So uh, the little hat is power. I've used a dot because it's an array of data. And uh, I'm then plotting that. Uh, so let's just, just right, so let's just, just run this and see what happens. So there we go. There's my, uh, there's my graph, um, which has now made it into a picture. Uh, let's just move this into my screen. There we are. There's my picture. Make that a bit smaller. So there we go. Uh, you can make that looking nice. Um, and then I've got a little sort of calculator here. So T dash in seconds. Let's go for one second. The elevator speed is the fraction of the speed of light. Let's go for 0.8. Uh, and then we can work out some times based on this. So the extra time in the lab frame is this one. So the total lab time, the lab, lab frame time is 1.67 seconds. All right, the Lorentz factor is 1.67. There we go. All right, so you can uh, make your own little calculator and notice it tells you the answers in whatever language you, you, you like to use, okay? So there we are. So making a calculator, making a plotter is a really nice idea when you've got these sort of new physics things. All right. Uh, any questions uh, before we move on? Any anything that's in the chat? No. 
Marvellous. Uh, you, can you still hear me, by the way? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're in contact. Fantastic. Great. Right. OK, a uh, bit of text on this one. So I think I'll skip over this. But basically, is this true? Right. Is this just a, a Gedanken experiment? Well, so far, Einstein's special relativity um, ha idea has passed every single test. Um, so here's there's, there's a particle called a pion, a neutral pion, these sort of things you get from the CERN. And these are traveling uh, very, very close to the speed of light. And what happens is these decay into two gamma photons. All right. Um, and basically, they measured <laughs> all of these things. And guess what? They're all traveling at the speed of light. So the fact that this is moving very fast and producing something at the speed of light, it ought to be the speed of light plus this speed, right? But it doesn't. It travels at the speed of light. Uh, and there's another one with neutral pions. So probably there's probably hundreds of experiments of this now, but um, it seems to work. Right. OK, um, so here we are. Now, uh, what we're going to do, um, rather than tell you what we're going to do, we'll uh, look at another situation. So we've had time dilation. What about space? So from the perspective of the astronauts, we're going to go on a journey to Alpha Centauri. So this is our, one of our, things, our nearest star, isn't it? About four light years away. OK, so four light years, the distance um, it takes light to travel in a year, basically. OK, which is, uh, here's a nice little idea if you've not met this. So a year is about pi times 10 to the seven seconds. That's a nice little ready reckoner. Um, so uh, how long does it take uh, my spacecraft to get to Alpha Centauri? Well, four CT year, right? Four years and it's times the speed of light. OK, uh, and I'm going uh, four fifths of the speed of light. So how long does that take? Well, uh, and I'm going to stay there for a year. So I'm going for a there and back. Right. So I've got four light years. I divide that by four fifths because I'm going four fifths of the speed of light multiplied by two. So that's five years there, five years back and a year at Alpha and Centauri to do some measurements. So the journey there and back is 11 years. And that symbol, the cross, means for Earth. Well, what about for the astronaut? OK, so I'm only going to time dilate the moving part. So I'm going to subtract one from 11 years. And I'm going to divide that by gamma because moving clocks run slow. Now, what's gamma? Uh, well, let's work it out. So one minus V squared over C squared. So V is four fifths C. So I've got one minus 16 over 25 to the power of minus a half. So one minus 16 over 25 is nine twenty fifths. So square root both of those. And this is a nice example. Pythagorean triples are a really good idea. So when you do the square rooting, you end up with some uh, some whole numbers. So that's going to be five thirds. All right. It's bigger than one. OK, uh, it's about one and a third. So if you divide 10 by that, uh, you'll get six. And then you add one, so that's seven years. So the astronaut takes seven years. On Earth, it's 11 years. All right. So there's a difference of four years here. All right. Um, OK. And we'll talk about the twins paradox in a little later. But if you had a, a twin on Earth and a twin on the spacecraft, right, the twin that comes back is going to be younger. All right. Which is kind of weird, isn't it? And of course, the faster you go, the bigger gamma is going to be. And the more time elapses on Earth for your time in a spacecraft. OK, so this could be a real problem for you know, intergalactic travel. <laughs> it may be right in your, well, not intergalactic, into you know, interstellar travel. It might be fine in your lifetime, but maybe the Earth has been incinerated if you're going at really fast speed. So this is a problem for science fiction, unfortunately. Um, so, but we've got a mystery here. So uh, there's something called a muon. It's like a heavy electron. There are muons, electrons and taus. And cosmic rays hit the top of the atmosphere and produce these muons. And you can detect these things. There's a whole science of using muon detector. I think there's something to do with earthquakes. And, uh, you know, read this up in physics. Well, it's fascinating. Uh, so uh, they hit the upper atmosphere and the muons are produced. They go through about 10 kilometers of atmosphere and they go to a detector on the Earth's surface. And this is the sort of reaction, if you like. The muons produce an electron, something called an electron neutrino, actually an antineutrino, um, and a muon antineutrino. Have I got that the right way around? Um, maybe Dr. Chung can tell me. Um, but anyway, so uh, it's like beta decay. Um, so basically, you've got, um, you've got these sort of tiny particles produced. Now, muons, they have a half-life of 2.2 microseconds. All right, so um, if you've got some, a, a bunch of muons, you know, uh, you've got a, a, bit, a, million, a million muons, 2.2 microseconds later, you're going to have half a million muons. Uh, you know, another 2.2 microseconds later, you will have 250,000 muons, etc. And they all travel at a really fast speed. 
So how long is that going to take to get to uh, the detector? Well, the, the height divided by the speed, that's about 34 microseconds. So how many half-lives is that? Well, you know, we can divide that by 2.2, it's about 15.5. So the muons that are created here, all right, by the time we get there, so we should, for basically every 45,000 muons that are here, we should get one here, okay? Because two to the minus 15.5 is about one in 45,000, all right? So most of them have decayed. So we should get a really tiny detection here compared to the top. And what we could do is we get the top of the atmosphere, put a muon detector and then a detector on the Earth and see if that ratio is correct. Trouble is, it's not correct at all. It's about an eighth. So what's the solution to this mystery? Well, OK, so moving clocks run slow. OK, uh, there's a joke here if you've read of it, so Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Um, so what we can do is we can time, we can work out our gamma factor, one minus 0.98 squared to the power of minus a half, and that's about five. So uh, if that the the, the, the sort of um, uh, the delta t dash that's in the lab frame, okay, so that's in the muons frame. So from our Professor Feynman lab frame, if you like, uh, the time dilated uh, half life is 11.1 .1 microseconds, not 2.2. So therefore, what's our expected fraction? Well, we divide 34 microseconds, the, there in the, the, sort of the time it takes from the top to bottom, by 11.1, .1, and that's about two to the minus three, which is about one and eighth. Okay, so this is consistent with our time dilation formula. Uh, so our calculator can be used again, but we have a problem here. What about the muon's perspective? Okay, so surely the muon experience a half-life of 2.2 microseconds. All right, uh, so don't we have a kind of a paradox here? Um, because how can they be different, right? Because surely the muons, they will see the kind of the earth coming towards it. So, so these things both can't be true. So the answer is that from the muons perspective, the distance it experiences coming towards it at 0.98c, all right, its relative speed is not 10 kilometers, but in fact, it's two kilometers. So the muon coming towards the Earth thinks it's traveling, if it can think at all. You've got the idea that the muon is moving two kilometers from its perspective, whereas uh, it takes, uh, um, you know, the, the times are dilated from our lab perspective. OK, so we can't just have time dilation. We've also got to have length contraction. And so uh, we end up with a very similar result. So that's the length of our moving object, like the T dash frame. Uh, and that's the length at rest. And this, so this, so this would be the length that the, um, you know, uh, the sort of uh, the object sort of, uh, so if we, if we sort of imagine how a kind of ruler moving at very, very high speed, we would see it contracted, okay? Uh, compared to the length at rest. Um, classic problem you'll do at university might be, or if you looked in books, is a sort of, um, I don't know, pole trying to fit into a garage or something like that, or a car trying to go into a garage, moving at very fast speeds, you know, near the speed of light. Um, and, you know, temporarily it will fit in the garage because it will be Lorentz contracted. Um, so uh, we're going to have this result. I don't think we really need to do the poem thing. Um, so <laughs> let's work it through. So we're going to use the same light clock idea. We're going to try and prove this formula that the length uh, here uh, compared to the length at rest is L over gamma. So what we're going to do, back to the elevator, we're going to shine some light from one side and it's going to bounce off a mirror. This is really the... Uh, Professor Feynman argument. So what's the there and back time? And we could use this with a data logger or something like this. So the light bounces off the mirror and comes back. So how long does it take? Well, remember this is the dashed frame, right? The moving frame, it says 2L over C. So L is the length of our, our elevator. Now, Professor Feynman, remember, is looking at the elevator coming past him at speed V. So let's assume the lengths are different as observed by Professor Feynman, all right? The elevator seems Lorentz contracted by some factor. And let's call that length L, it makes it different from big L. So how long does that take? So, and now this is a little argument which you tend not to see in books. They often skip to the answer and I used to get really confused by this. So hopefully I won't confuse you, you can let me know. <laughs> so what we do first is to get the total distance traveled by the light, it's gonna be the speed of light, times the time it takes to get from the source to the mirror. And so time from source to mirror. So what is that time? 
Well, it's going to be L. But remember, the mirror is moving. All right. It's moving at speed V. So in that time, delta T S M for there back time, it's moved an extra bit of distance. OK, so uh, if you do sort of do a bit of factorization, if we move um, delta T to this side, so we've got C minus V in brackets times delta T equals L. And then delta TSM is L over the difference in the speeds. Hope that's all right. And then uh, when we go back the other way, all right, okay, you know, so the, the source is now a bit closer because it's moving towards the mirror. So uh, we have to take away um, from L the distance that, that uh, the source is coming towards us. That's V delta T mirror to source. Uh, so that's that whole thing is C delta T mirror to source. That's the distance light travels. And so we can work out delta T mirror to source is all over C plus V. OK, these are different times. The time it takes to go from there to there is different from the time it takes to get to the mirror and back. Right. So let's put that together. The total there and back time is given by this. So mathematicians amongst you, you must immediately look at this and go, oh, right. I've got a difference of two squared possibility here. So we combine those things habitually. All right, so we multiply them together and we've got, um, you know, sort of uh, C plus V and C minus V on top. And if you do a bit of algebra, we've got a difference of two squares downstairs. So C squared minus V squared. On top, our V's cancel. So we've got 2LC over C squared minus V squared. Now, we had this gamma factor. So we want to see if we can recover something that looks a bit like this. So if we factor out C from downstairs, uh, in fact, C squared from downstairs, we can cancel this out. So 2L over C. And then we've got downstairs, which is gamma squared. Remember, gamma is this uh, thing I'm circling at the moment. Now that we've got to look at the time dilation result. OK, so delta T dash is delta T of the gamma and 2L over C is delta T dashed. All right. So that's the distance it travels in the in the moving frame. OK, so what we can say is let's just substitute for that. Uh, so what have we got? We've got uh, delta T here um, is gamma delta T dashed. All right. And that will cancel one of these gammas. So two delta two L over C is two L over C gamma. And we can direct, take out the C's and the twos. And now we've proved our Lorentz our contract, contraction result. So Professor Feynman observes the elevator width to be squished relative to the measurement of the astronaut. So time dilation, length contraction. And you'd have thought, surely that's enough. But no. <laughs> there is a third effect. So uh, we did a little bit more work here. So any questions popped up in the chat, Nina? Um, there is a few. So maybe if you could very quickly summarize again what uh, length contraction means. Sure. Um, just very so, simple terms. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go back to the glass elevator. So if, if you're in the elevator, here's my spaceman producing with the lights. The light's coming from his source, bouncing off the mirror and coming back. And big L is the width of my elevator. All right. So the, the there and back time is 2 L over C. Now, Professor Fine, remember, if we go back to our, there we go. That's his perspective. Of course, in this case, we don't have the pulse going from the top. It's coming from the side. But he's seeing the elevator come past him at speed V. So what's, um, what's the result from his perspective? Uh, oops. There we go. So um, he will measure a different length. He will experience a different length of our elevator. Uh, we don't know what that is yet, but um, you know, given where we are, you know, if we said the times are different, probably the lengths are different too. Okay, And we're trying to prove this result. This is what solves the muon mystery. Um, so we have to sort of show that's true. So L and L, big L are not the same. And then what we've done is we looked at the sort of um, um, you know, the there and back time as observed by Professor Feynman, okay, using this little calculation. So the total there and back time oops, is given by this, and we can relate that in terms of L, C, and gamma, all right? And then what we do is we replace, use our time dilation results, all right, to replace, um, what have we got? So, uh, do, 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 uh, yeah, we've got this one here, and we're gonna replace that, okay, so 2L over C, all right, is we can replace it with this one. Um, and basically we can substitute for our delta T here. And what you'll find is one of the gammas will cancel. And then we've got um, L is big L over gamma, basically. And so we, that's how that result is. All right. So that's so um, but in, in, in sort of simple terms, Professor Feynman seems a squished elevator. So if my elevator was, I don't know, say, um, 
uh, let's just say it's two meters wide, all right, and it's going at uh, uh, with a gamma factor of two, <laughs> all right, Professor Feynman would observe it to be one meter wide. Okay, all right, so loss of simultaneity. Um, I'll take a few more questions. So uh, we've got a third idea, and that's we've got some sort of explosion of light, all right, some sort of I know, chemical which produces light from photons, maybe my my pion particle, perhaps we could do something more exciting. And that happens inside the middle of my elevator. So the spaceman is in the elevator observing this and we'll measure the light going at speed C, left and right. OK, now um, we need to talk about what we mean by an event. So uh, let's define two of them. So uh, R means the right detector receives the pulse and L means the left detector receives the pulse. OK. So what does Professor Feynman see? Um, so let's work out the time elapsed since the light source was created for events R and L. OK, so remember, this is Professor Feynman's frame. So we're going to use the same idea that we had before. So how far does the light travel going in the right one? Well, C delta T R. Well, that's the time delay from the start to hitting the right detector. So it's going to travel um, in Professor Feynman's frame at half L, not half big L and the time it takes to the extra time because the elevator is moving. So there we go. There's my delta T R. We can do the same for the left one. And remember, the left mirror uh, is basically or the left detector, should I say, is catching up. So it's going to travel a half L. Remember, that's what Professor Feynman measures the half length of it. And then we're going to have a little bit less to travel because it's taking delta T L to get from there to there. So if you rearrange that, you've got delta T L is this one. So the difference in time rather than the total time is what we're interested in, right? Because in the elevator frame, the time it takes to get from the middle to the detector is going to be the same for each one because they're traveling the same distance, half L, and they're going at speed C. So what happens in Professor Feynman's frame? Well, let's look at the difference in those. So there's a little bit of algebra to do. Uh, it's kind of the same as what we did before. We combine those two fractions and we end up with this result. So to sort of cut to the chase, uh, delta T for the Feynman's frame is gamma V L over C squared. Now that's not zero. So basically events which are simultaneous that happen at the same time in the elevator frame do not happen at the same time in Professor Feynman's frame. They get out of sync. So this is really weird. Um, it's known as rear clock ahead in lots of books. But personally, I do find those a little bit confusing. So um, hopefully you'll agree with me, but work through this. This is probably the slightly harder one to do. Um, but the idea is we've got a difference in the time. So the event of the pulse reaches this one and the pulses reaches this one from Professor Feynman is different. It's out of sync for what happens in the uh, elevator frame. Now that's different from time dilation and, the and length contraction. That's just a change in the rate that time ticks. This is actually an offset in the clock. It's like your clock sort of shifting a few minutes either way. So this um, we can put together to form what we call the twins paradox. And this is another really good example of putting some code together to try and visualize this. All right, because this is a bit of, this is a brain buster for pretty much all students. So I'll try my best to give introduce this, but you probably want to have another go. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put all the, all the ideas together. So let's go back to our Alpha Centauri example. OK, so we've got our spacecraft going at four fifths the speed of light and uh, it goes to Alpha Centauri, spends a year there and then turns around, comes back at the same speed. So it takes 11 years from the Earth's perspective and our astronaut twin. We time dilate the moving bit. So we divide it by gamma. All right. Uh, and that turns it into five years. Sorry. Uh, so six years. It's th three apiece. And we add the year that it's at Alpha Centauri, where let's just say it's not moving very much. So one year there is the same as one year on the Earth. So the Earth twin should be older by four years. Now, here we have a problem. From the perspective of the astronaut, the brother has just receded away and then returned at the same speed. So imagine you're sitting on, on, the, on the rocket. You see Alpha Centauri coming towards you and the Earth going away. So really, is that any different? to the Earth seeing the spacecraft going away and coming back. It shouldn't really be, right? So how does that work? Surely from the astronaut's perspective, the Earth-bound brother 
should be <laughs> younger by four years. So they both these those things can't be true, all right? When the uh, twin on the spacecraft comes back, right, you will discover, and actually we've not done this with this experiment, but with smaller amounts of times on clocks on Concorde and that kind of thing, this all works. This is true. You know, our GPS satellites wouldn't work unless we took into account special relativity. Um, so um, how do we, how can we mean the, the alternative perspective is wrong? What's going on? Well, the answer is our loss of simultaneity. And the reason is, can anyone spot what the reason is? What have we done that's different from what we've seen before in terms of the motion? See what you think. There is one key difference in this there and back journey. What's different from every example we've met so far? We got the Australia is accelerating and then initial frame of reference. All oh, right, it's a really good one. Yes, so it's not moving at constant speed. And in fact, that's another way of looking at this. But fundamentally, it's got to turn around, right? So, and yes, that to do that, it must decelerate and accelerate. But the fact is that the frame of reference coming back is not the same as the frame of reference going forward, all right? It's going the other way. So how do we take that into account? So a uh, little bit of maths here. Um, and what we can basically do is combine all those three effects together in what we call a Lorentz transformation. So this is your math recipe for working out this in general. And what we do is we have a reference frame called S, X, Y, and Z. And we've got another reference frame moving at speed big V. And by uh, convention, it's in the X direction. So there's no velocity in the X and Y directions. And so what we can do is we can work out um, what the coordinates of things in the S or the S dash frame are. So remember that our convention is this is a kind of moving one, if you like, that will be the astronaut, that will be the earth, although it's can obviously swap them around. So um, what we've got, let's just look to see if we can sort of make sense of this. So the X dash plus V dash, v, VT dash, well, you know, that's that's the sort of, um, we've got an extra bit of uh, a sort of time in this frame um, because the frame's actually moving and we can sort of shift it. So that, so if we didn't have the gamma factor, that would be the same as, uh, as normal, all right? Because the frame is moving too by this distance. But we're gonna have to basically multiply it by gamma. That's gonna be our, or um, Lorentz contraction sort of idea, or Lorentz expansion in this case. Um, uh, and we can rearrange that as well. And then we've got a time dilation formula we can incorporate here, and incorporating our uh, loss of simultaneity bit. So time dilation and loss of simultaneity. Uh, both have a gamma factor. So this is, uh, you could program this up and you could work out, I don't know, uh, a sort of trajectory in this, <laughs> or a, a picture or a curve or something like this, maybe a picture of your face, in this coordinates and then transform it to what it might be. And you'd find the whole thing is squished. Um, so um, we can actually apply this uh, for the twins paradox. So I'm just doing exactly the same thing. I've worked out the time in my uh, frame of my spacecraft. So um, fi uh, five years, uh, sorry, five years. So T is the time in years. In this one becomes three T in my dashed frame. And there we go. And the same for this one. Um, but if I do this, all right, let's go for the spaceship. Is, so this is Earth is rest, spaceship moves. And this is a spaceship is at rest and the Earth moves. So we do this and the time for Alpha Centauri is nine fifths T. If you put this together, this is using the Lorentz transform. I'm just literally substituting my numbers. So I get not, <laughs> they get a difference in time. So the tone, time elapsed on Earth during relative motion, according to this, uh, is three and three fifths years, all right? So what's happened to the missing six and two fifths? <laughs> well, basically that's the loss of simultaneity result. And the reason is we've changed our reference frame. So this little minus sign here, we're gonna swap it. So what you do is this is my original frame of reference. So this is how much time it takes uh, in the sort of astronaut frame, nine fifths T. And then coming back, all right, uh, we've got this one. Notice there's a change in minus there. So the difference in time, all right, the extra Earth time, if you like, uh, is going to be six and two fifths, which is exactly what we're missing. I know I've done that pretty quickly, um, but the idea is that without loss of simultaneity, we do have a paradox. But if we use the fact that we changed reference frames and we now have a, a, a time offset, uh, that takes into account 
uh, the fact that um, you know we could have a difference in perspective. So indeed, the twin is actually going to be younger than the one on the Earth, right? So there is no paradox. The twins, the twins paradox is not a paradox. So you want to think, okay, gosh, I'm a bit overwhelmed by all these numbers. Um, you know, is there a picture we can draw? Yes, we can. And so I think I might sort of finish off with this one, unless there's more questions um, by this little simulation. So this is something that I would, um, if you say the first thing, if we plotted the gamma factor, made a calculator, that'd be a brilliant thing to do. You could then do the same for how things are going to get Lorentz contracted. Uh, third B, you could actually implement the Lorentz transforms to do a kind of two dimensional transformation. You know, something going faster, what would it look like? Um, and then this might be uh, the next step, you know, if you really got to grips with this. So I like this is what I'd recommend is that I'm going to plot Earth time in years versus space time. So T and T dash. And I'm going to track that for the journey. So let's see if we can understand what's going on here. So basically, so the Earth from the spacecraft, OK, <laughs> and this is the spacecraft from the Earth is the red one. So let's do that first. So basically, spacecraft, so it takes uh, five years uh, to get to Alpha Centauri, and then one year elapses, OK, and then it's another five years, and that basically takes uh, around 11 years from the perspective of the, that's the Earth time. The spacecraft time is, what was that, seven years? OK, that's the red line here. So uh, that's got to end up at the same point. Otherwise, we've got a paradox. All right. So the Earth time and the spacecraft time have got to agree once the thing gets back to Earth. If that's not the case, we've got our paradox. All right. So hopefully that's a kind of nicer way, a pictorial way of thinking about it. So uh, what we do is remember, this is the Earth from the spacecraft. Right. So the spacecraft time is like this. OK, and a bit less time is now on the Earth because it's time dilated. But then what happens? It decelerates. And then we've got this massive jump in time on the Earth. So it's sort of like the, from the perspective of the spacecraft, uh, the Earth time suddenly skips ahead as it's decelerating, which is kind of a strange idea. But that's what loss of simultaneity means. Now, when they're not moving, time ticks at the same rate. That's why that curve is along. They're, they follow the same line there. And then the spacecraft turns around, accelerates again. So the Earth time, from its perspective, jumps ahead. And then uh, the, uh, from the spacecraft's perspective, and remember this is Earth from spacecraft, that's going to be time dilated. All right, so less time exists on Earth than it does from the spacecraft. I think I've got that right. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> anyway, these little gaps there, because these are less steep than the red ones, that's taken into account by our jumps. So there we go. Um, if you want to make sense of this, write a little program that plots these two perspectives. And I think that's, as, that's, 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 that's the best I can manage anyway. Maybe some of you can plot a slightly different diagram. Um, and this is what we call a space time diagram. Um, so what we've got is we've got distance here and we've got time along here. We might have that time times the speed of light to have them the same uh, you know, dimensions if we want. But you know, this, this is sort of fine. So basically what you do, uh, we've got the spacecraft from Earth. All right. So that goes takes five years, one year, and then back. All right, so that's the 11 years. It travels five light years. And the Earth from the spacecraft, all right, remember it's a Lorentz contracted. Okay, uh, so that's going to be a bit less. Uh, what about 2.4 uh, light years, something like this. There's our distance that we don't change, and then we come back. And it's taken, uh, what's seven years uh, to achieve that. I think that's right, yeah. So there we go. Um, that's the Twins Paradox in picture format. We've got time dilation, Lorentz, uh, Lorentz contraction, so length contraction, and we've got loss of simultaneity. We could all derive all three from our elevators, um, our light clocks, etc. And this all comes from the fact that the speed of light is a constant uh, for all observers, regardless of your relative motion. All right, so you have to transform space and time for that to be true. So there we go. I think we have got to nine o'clock. That is a good place to finish. Uh, there are some extras, including the proof of equals mc squared. And if you download the presentation, uh, you can work that through yourself. Um, I really just, if you really want to know an extra, I'll just show you one little thing very briefly. So you can work out how velocities transform uh, in these different reference frames. It's called relativistic aberration if it's the speed of light. And this is a really nice thing to plot. This is going to be in Science by Sim 3. Um, so you can work out the angle of light 
as your light source moves. So basically, here's a, here's a, here's a light source and the zero speed. And as the light source gets faster and faster and faster, you sort of see a concentration of the light sort of behind it. Uh, it's a bit like a kind of, um, you know, sort of dot, uh, mark cone shock waves and things, not quite the same thing. But basically the angle that light uh, comes at you is varied uh, depending on how fast you go. So this is a really nice simulation. So you could look at uh, like how velocities transform as well. Um, but there's lots of other bits and bobs. OK, um, are there any more last questions? Otherwise, we will go. Any questions? Nope. OK, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, um, what are we doing next actually, there are, there are a few. I don't know whether you want to take a look um, that are still outstanding. OK, right. So, um, yes, I mean, the, um, the idea. Uh, so <laughs> muons have been used to detect hidden tunnels in the pyramids. Yes, there's all sorts of things in muons. Um, so yes, I, 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 was, uh, I think Dr. Chung might be more, much more an expert at this than I, but um, you can get the loss of simultaneity to tell you your difference in time. But the actual, um, in my graph, uh, if I show that, I've made it straight. Now that's not really very realistic. Of course, the spacecraft will decelerate and then accelerate. There'll be a bit of time here. I think you'll find if you do the mass of this, because uh, of course it's special relativity, actually could we use it? I think we can do it with uh, accelerating frames, but uh, we will find that You'll get the same answer, but it won't be just a jump. All right. You're going to have to sort of get to that point. Um, but that's going to be a bit harder to do because you're going to be changing your frame of reference continuously as you go. You need to be a bit careful there. Um, so, yes. To do, it, uh, to do it properly requires you to do general relativity. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, but you should get the same answer. Um, so, uh, so I think, you know, at this point, uh, let's just say on the time scales of our, our, our experiment, the acceleration time is suitably small. That we can't plot it on this graph maybe it's like a you know a few hours or something like this um but yes zooming in on the behavior there is going to be much more advanced um but uh, but you know what you're heading for remember physics is all about kind of like a hierarchy of models you want the sort of simplest model that tells you what's going on but you're going to have to make some approximations and it's those sort of uh, you know uh, it's a bit like air resistance you know if you drop a a bowling ball and you, know, uh, you can ignore air resistance but if you drop a feather in air then obviously that's now a much bigger bigger part that you need to take into account you can't ignore it anymore okay um any more questions okay in that case thank you very much indeed uh next week we are looking at waves and optics uh, so, um, but uh, we won't be doing too much. I don't think we're doing any special relativity there, but we are going to be in talk about light and various models uh, of that. So, um, yes, and I might show you some anamorphic projections uh, if you know what that is or are excited to find out. Come next week. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you next time.